This meeting is being recorded. Hello. Welcome everybody to our go, um, Making Metered Lighting Smart and Simple webinar. Lovely to see all your faces here today. We're back in the land of lighting webinars and it's nice to be here. We've got some awesome guests for this session. We welcome you all. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge the First Nation people throughout this land. I'm speaking um, and we're speaking on the traditional lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne. And I would like to acknowledge them as traditional owners and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the land. We're age-old ceremony. Yeah. I'm going to move straight into housekeeping and ask everybody to mute themselves and even Charlotte if you can just do a mute all thing that'd be awesome. Uh, this is what we've got installed today so I'm going to give a bit of a rundown, welcome, housekeeping, background, uh, talk about us, talk about you from the surveys that we received in advance. We've got two amazing guests from the University of Melbourne, Teresa Jones, who is the Assistant Dean Research Capability and Development Associate Professor in Evolutionary and Behavioural Ecology at Melbourne Uni. That's a real mouthful, Teresa. Uh, and Marty Lockett, much easier, PhD, Urban Light Lab. Looking at the lighting effects on environment and wildlife, um, I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing in a case study or two in this area. And we've got Ming Chao Chi from the city of Greater Dandenong. Um, I've got some guests here in the Ironbark studio and online as well to help us out. And so Charlotte's helping us with the advice and the tech. Abhishek, who is one of our lighting design gurus who we brought over from New Zealand just to work in this space. Um, and we've got this new guy uh, online, Paul Brown, who's like the work experience person who's just starting out in lighting, also the managing director of Ironbark and uh, is... Obviously, a bit of an expert and uh, probably the foremost expert in Australia to help out. And so Paul and Abhishek are going to jump online if you've got any questions. You all know how to use Zoom by now. Jump in and ask questions if you like. I'm sure that'll be quite straightforward enough. Whatever we can't get to, we'll jump into at the end and or we can always follow up afterwards. And as most people here know, you can always contact Ironbark down the track and we can have a chat. A little bit of housekeeping, we're going to keep it pretty informal. We're going to stick to time. And so to our guests and guest speakers, just note that we'll push you along so we can have some Q&A time towards the end. We are recording, so this will be available into perpetuity for those that can't make it um, and for those that just, you know, love to get their heads back into smart lighting and metered lighting every couple of days. Um, and, yeah, just mute yourself, please. That's a bit of a rookie error, but we all do it every now and then. Um, I'd also encourage you to jump in if you can put your Zoom handle with your name, your organisation and the land that you're calling from. And if you are able to show us your face and show us your video, uh, it's nicer, but appreciate. That's not for everyone. And finally, uh, anyone who's here, you'll receive this docker, this little short, sharp guide that we've developed. It's just something to keep on hand when you're looking at metered lighting. Um, it's called the Making Metered Lighting Smart and Simple, three questions or key questions that every council needs to ask, a good kind of resource to keep on hand. So at the end of this, we've got a survey to get your thoughts. Once you tell us what you thought about this, that document is in your hot hands. All right. This is us. Um, proud to kind of, for the first time ever, show this photo from a staff strategy day last week. This is our growing iron bark team. Uh, we've been around for about 15, 18 years. We work with councils around Australia to help them reduce energy and emissions. We have a smart lighting program. Most of you are here for that today, I'd imagine. And we have a climate program, but that's pretty much all we do. We work with councils and their communities to help reduce emissions and improve sustainability. We've got about 35 to 40 staff now, depending on where you draw the line. We've got a couple of broader programs and we take a programmatic approach to the work that we do. Lighting and climate are the main ones. We do a bit of building and um, sustainability, but I whip through that really quickly because having looked at the attendees, most of you guys have been to these before and know who we are. This is you. 
Um, well, this was you up until last night. There have been some others that have jumped on. I'm not going to name names, but the organisations and who's here in this virtual room today. Congratulations, Hume City Council. I think you win for the most attended numbers there. It's great to see you guys, a couple of bold faces um, and some new faces and a nice little mix, although big representation from Western Australia, which was great to see. So Walga and WA, who have been leading alliance over the last couple of years, I know have passed this on to some of their networks. And so great to have you guys here. We did the 2 p.m. instead of the 10 a.m. start so we could cater for all states. We've got a really nice mixture of people who are here, who have been at council for anywhere from less than a year to more than 11 years. And so really quite consistent there. Some other questions that we asked in advance, and just noting that this is handy to know who is in the virtual room. And we also try and use this to think about how we're actually gonna pitch today and the sort of things that we can focus on or the sort of things that we actually realize we don't need to mention that at all. So really appreciate people spending the time and responding because we do incorporate it. We always try to make sure that any of this data goes back to everyone as well. Um, couple of people, probably 25% of the organisations that are here who have got a uh, smart lighting strategy or are planning to create one. Potentially that's a bit skewed by councils that are here, uh, have multiple representation from councils. Uh, a lot that aren't sure or just don't have one. It's probably not too unexpected to see that. This is an interesting one. How much do you know about your council's metered lighting assets? And so, um, again, most people who have some idea or know where every light is and what type of lights is, which is great. And so that means a lot of councils, I guess, are well beyond that auditing stage and can look at what they're actually going to do. Some that um, don't have as much information on hand. One of the benefits about having smart lighting is that um, it can at times be easier to deal with residential complaints. And so that's why we've asked this one and we'll go through some examples as well. So we asked how much time you spend dealing with resident complaints. No one says it's the bane of our existence or everyone's being a little bit polite. Some people find it challenging or it's not that bad, a lot where it just doesn't affect you. So potentially there are other people in council that have to um, you know, have that as their key KPI or the thing that they're looking into. And the final question we asked you was, do you understand what the Minamata Convention is? So most do. Um, we'll touch on this in the Q&A at the end um, and just why it is important, or at least it's a driver of a lot of the change that's happening and something to keep in mind if you're trying to make the case internally at council to move things, because if you're not aware of this or the impacts, then it can be a bit of a risk. You don't need to take down this slide, but I'm just putting all the questions that everyone had out there. I can't recall a webinar where we've had so many questions um, considering the amount of attendees, which is great. Um, there are too many, we're not gonna get to all of them now, but just to keep ourselves accountable, here they are. And those that fill in the form afterwards and give us some feedback will also receive this PowerPoint and the PowerPoints, or you can just email me offline if you like. Um, so you can have a look at those questions and we'll try and get back to these if we don't answer them now, even developing a bit of a quick Q&A document and so we can get those responses out to people. All right. The ownership structure of um, the majority of public lighting in Australia, um, I guess, has been a challenge over the years uh, that councils have had to overcome before council starting over the, started changing over their street lights to LEDs in their hundreds of thousands, and we must be up to eight or 900,000 by now. The ownership structure was a key barrier because of the DNSPs who owned and operated the lights um, and councils that were paying for them. The standard energy hungry mercury vapors on residential roads that should have been changed to LEDs straight away. Um, and if you haven't, you're paying 5.6 times the energy use of the 160, 70 councils who have. These are the lights that councils don't own, owned, operated, managed by distribution network providers or DNSPs. And there are barriers that have, red tape, I guess, that's had to be reduced to actually um, get us as a sector to be now leading the world when it comes to changing these over. Most councils, of course, will also have anywhere between a few hundred and a few thousand open space lights that are completely within their, your, our control to operate, manage, upgrade and maintain. So also known as metered lighting, open space lighting sometimes, you have all the control, they're yours. 
So this includes parks, car parks, sports lights, pedestrian lighting off streets. Uh, typically 10%, just a bit of a rule of thumb of the number of street lights that you've got. So if you've got 10,000 street lights with the distribution business, there might be another thousand odd outdoor metered lighting to control and manage. Um, these are, can be decorative or standard. I think we find that there's a lot more decorative. Abhishek should jump in if I'm not right there. And of course, this is lights that are metered as opposed to model the energy use. And so you've actually got a, a meter box so you know what the energy use is for all of them. Um, traditionally, the challenges around managing and changing over metered lighting has been funding. Um, so it can be a lot more expensive. So even though you've got that control, you often are probably advised to undertake some sort of a detailed design. The lights per light are more expensive than those bulk change rollouts that we've had because there you're doing a like for like, just take down the 80 watt mercury vapor, chuck up a street lead. Here it can be a lot more complex. We do have some questions around funding and I'll point everyone to the LCRI Funding uh, the Fed's funding. If we're not a, if you're not aware of that, there's an article on our website about that at the moment. A challenge has been around quality lighting design. So you generally want to be involving designers who understand the standards pretty well. Um, so you know it's important to meet objectives that you have as their lights that you own and operate around spill, safety, etc. In public areas. Um, it's not unusual, you know, that product selection in this area can be a challenge because you can find, from our experience, we've seen that, you know, councils might be installing lights that might not meet their expectations or the relevant standards. Uh, and another challenge has been perceptions around um, public lighting or of increased lighting, it's especially at the moment. Um, you see, you know, there's different and competing priorities around more light, less light. But we're going to hear some amazing things from our friends at Melbourne University today. Um, to look at um, what it means and, you know, whether we're after more or less warmer, whiter, blue, not blue light. Um, that's my basic take on it. We've got some technical experts that will be able to talk to that. Um, but one of the challenges that comes across frequently. However, there are just a lot of opportunities. Um, so if you had your utopia, it's not the utopia I'm after, this utopia, so this perfect world, right, where you have complete control over your lighting assets. No need to worry about those complex negotiations with DNSPs or frustration over delays and getting that light approved, um, the ability to purchase, install the LEDs that you want. No third party procurement. This is the situation that we have when we're talking about lighting, beaded lighting. Um, you've just got a lot more control and there's not as much concern around split incentives, dealing with multiple stakeholders. And so we've got opportunities around Hello, hello, hello. Come on, work. If you could please slide. Um, better lighting quality um, and an understanding about what you want to do with the lights. Um, smart lighting, smart light technology. So getting smart city ready. So with smart PE cells, um, you know, you can put up these lights with smart PE cells that can then start talking to gateways and CMS as a central management systems which moves us to the big, bad, big, wonderful world of smart lighting control. Um, a lot of the new lights, they've got LED, smart LED drivers, so that gives you a, a lot more control to dim, monitor status of failure of lights or otherwise. Um, new technology that can remotely send commands over the airways to dim or monitor faults, whatever it might be, manage consumption in real time. There were a few questions around smart lighting in the um, pre-webinar registration. I'm going to point you to two resources instead of going over it now, and Charlotte's going to send you the links to these. Um, but essentially, smart lighting incorporates sensors, and communication devices to allow lights to communicate with other lights and to be controlled at a city or distribution business level. It's connected to the internet so you can control it remotely. All right. I'm just having a look to see there's no questions, which is great. And I'm now going to introduce our first guest or guests. Um, Marty and Teresa, welcome. Where are you on the Zoom world? I'm sitting next to you on my screen, but I don't know where I am. So you can move me up, I think. Hello, I'm at the top. Are you, you're going first, I understand. Yes, I can share my screen. Yeah. Lovely to see you again. Teresa has spoken. Hi. So up many times and blown us away with their presentations and we get to meet Marty for the first time 
Um, I'll pass over to you guys to share your screen. Looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Cool, thank you. Okay, how's that? Have we got a screen? Yes. Yep, okay. So it's always a little bit difficult coming in after an intro to that because my utopia looks quite different to um, Lexi's utopia, but let's run with it. What I'm going to talk to for the next three minutes, so it's going to be a really whistle-stop tour as we go through this. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the impact of light at night and not just for its ability to change the nighttime environment, make it more friendly for humans, but also the impact it might be having more broadly. So I'm going to really be thinking about the ecology at light at night. I'm not because my screen is not working. Hang on. There we go. So the thing that all of us know is light is integral to everything. Right? It's integral to seasonality. In fact, our seasons are defined not by the thing we think they're defined by temperature, but actually down to changing light levels. Those changing light levels define in the northern hemisphere, but certainly where I come from, our summer, what we have of it, our autumn, winter, and our spring. But they also define our daily activity when we sleep and when we wake. If we're a diurnal species, so active in the day like ourselves, and we're awake during the day, we're asleep at night. If you're a nocturnal species, then it's the reverse. You tend to become more active as the sun goes down. But what's interesting is when we think about nighttime, we often think about it as being full darkness, but there's a lunar cycle associated with the light. And so even that nighttime environment, the light associated with it is really important. All of the animals that you can see in front of you today are active at night. Even the iconic woolly wagtail that you can see at the bottom. Males of the woolly wagtail sing at night to attract females. They do this under a full moon when it's bright light, and they do so because they want to increase their mating success. Actually, when we put light at night in there, it dampens that full moon cycle, but it changes patterns of behavior. And this is what our light, our nights now look like. So obviously most of you are familiar with this. It's composite image, satellite image of light at night. It's from a few years ago, so it's even brighter than this um, uh, picture shows you. What's important to realize though is that quite a lot of animals and, and plants obviously are active at night. 28% of all vertebrates, most bats, and over 60% of invertebrates, including our pollinators, are active at night. They've evolved to be in a nocturnal environment. So does this matter? It does, because what we now know over the last 20 years, we've been accumulating information and research associated with the impact of light at night. And I'm not gonna go in any detail. Marty's gonna talk a little bit about some of the research. What we know just as a snapshot is that if we have light in an environment, it masks natural light cycles. It can change sleep patterns, not just of ourselves, but also the possums that we live with and all the animals that are active at night. It can affect levels of hormones and that can affect physiology and change reproduction. The spider that you can see at the bottom there, under light conditions, it actually grows much smaller and produces less offspring. Its survival is also impacted. Overall, it can affect health and fitness. But it's not just the physiology. What you can see in these pictures, the top six pictures are all images of how light can affect behavior. It affects our behavior, we put lights. This is the top left picture here that you can see my cursor on, is our local footy oval. There's the moon, full moon in the background, and there's the footy oval lights. We put lights because we want to change our own behavior and activity, but those lights are also attracting animals like this moth. But not just one moth, maybe tens, if not hundreds of moths, and beetles and other insects. Maybe even millions, whole ecosystems are being changed because of the presence of light. And it's not just invertebrates, there are other vertebrates unlike ourselves. What you can see in these images here are birds and bats, possibly a large insect in there too, attracted to the light. They don't just get attracted though, they can be trapped by those lights. So those birds are in the, the twin tower lights are actually trapped in there. Now interesting, they turn them off every so often. They have people counting until they get to a certain number, then they turn the lights off and it releases the animals from this environment. So it can do all of these things. And most recently we're realizing that it can also have impacts on biodiversity. All of the things that we see happening within light are now having cascading effects through to whole ecosystems and changing biodiversity. In Europe, we're really worried about um, biodiversity declines, particularly for pollinators. They're being affected by light at night. So three problems I want to highlight and then Marty can carry on. The first one is intensity and duration. And the problem with light is that light is light. 
one of the reasons that other physiology is impacted is because we have certain hormones and we have um, little clocks in our bodies as do other species. The blue line that you can see waving here is melatonin circulating through your body. At the moment, the bright light that you're all sitting under is depressing it down here. Usually melatonin peaks at night and it does its thing. It often helps us go to sleep. It protects many of the cells of life. It's a really powerful antioxidant. But it's not just sunlight that stops melatonin production. Artificial light stops it too. So one of the things that happens in the presence of light, both intensity and the duration, is that it stops one of the key processes driving some of our physiology. And that can have impacts on health. The second thing that's happening is, and you've just mentioned this, Lexi, is that we're having massive shifts towards LEDs. People are changing these beautiful, I personally think beautiful yellow lights to more blue-white lighting. And we can see that in our streets. And that has an impact. The reason it has an impact is because life evolved in the, in the oceans. Now, this is why blue light is important. Blue light is important because when life evolved in the oceans, biology needed a way of telling when it was day. The reason it needs that is because if it's daytime and you're at the surface, you're exposed to UV radiation. Early life didn't have sunscreen, so what it does is goes down low. And the color of light that best moves down through the ocean and scatters far is blue. And so that has become the color of light. And this trickles through ancient um, bacteria all the way through to our cells. Blue light is really important. We're hypersensitive to blue light, and that's the key color of light that stops melatonin production. Plankton in our oceans move up and down in relation to the amount of blue light. We actually have a visual system that is centered around green light. This V here is green. This blue thing here we see with the C is our circadian. We have non-visual photoreceptors in our eyes. They don't perceive um, uh, uh, images, but they actually control our circadian system. It's centered around blue light. So when we knock blue light out of our, our lights or, or our phones, we're protecting that circadian system. So this global shift to LED lighting is problematic. Here's the old yellow lighting and here's the spectral distribution and here's the new LED. It aligns perfectly with our circadian um, 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 sensitivity. So it's got potential to disrupt even further. And the third problem, unfortunately, is one size does not fit all. You might think, well, let's just keep it yellow or let's just shift some of the color temperatures. But what we know is that not all animals respond equally. Knocking out the blue light does, for example, help a magpie, but it doesn't help a pigeon. They seem to be awake regardless of what color lighting you use. So we need to be really careful when we're thinking about these three key points. All right, I'm gonna stop there and then hand over to Marty. So that's just a bit of background in terms of light. Marty's gonna talk a little bit about some of the projects that he's been involved in and uh, um, allude to some of the things that we might be thinking about in terms of strategy. Thanks, Teresa. <clears throat> um... I just wanted to touch on, uh, pick a couple of examples of re recent projects that we've worked on that really emphasise that um, artificial light at night is is not something that's just affecting, um, you know, baby turtles and cute kangaroos and things that perhaps most of us don't interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's also affecting all the wildlife around us where we live in our streets and gardens and parks and even car parks. Uh, so next slide, Trevor. Um, so the first study was uh, one we did uh, a few years ago in the city of Moreland in Melbourne's north. Uh, and we just went out and we sampled the insect communities uh, under streetlights and in the dark places between streetlights. And we just wanted to see what effects streetlights were still having, even in these areas that had been you know, heavily modified and, and um, illuminated for um, you know, at least 20 years or more. And to our surprise, streetlights were continuing to have a really, really strong effect on insect communities. Um, and without going into detail too much, as you can sort of see from that chart at the bottom, what we found was that um, the distance from the light was important, the intensity of the light was important, and also the color of the light was important. And so just to pick one example, um, airborne insects were much more abundant under street lights than they were at some distance from a street light. But when you looked at areas that were lit with different colors of lighting, they were also more abundant where there was that um, uh, that redder, warmer coloured shades of lighting, which suggests that um, uh, in the areas where you have that very blue-white LED, that that's actually negatively impacting the overall insect population. And we found um, that there were real differences in the, in the impacts on flying versus ground-dwelling insects. So just to re-emphasise, these issues can sometimes be complex and, it's, and there's not necessarily one-size-fits-all. 
Um, the other study I just wanted to touch on very briefly was, was to look at a, a fundamental Australian wood, wood <coughs> food chain in Australian woodlands. Um, sorry, next slide, thanks, Teresa. Um, which is, um, so for those of you who, who don't know, um, a, a common insect on eucalyptus leaves are these uh, lerp psyllids. They're the adults on the left. They lay the eggs there in the center. And on the right, we can see um, lerps. And what these lerps are are the little nymphs when they hatch. Uh, they're very soft bodied and they don't like being exposed to the cold and the heat and the wind. And they build these little shelters over themselves using excess carbohydrate that they secrete. Um, and that's a big job for a little bug to build that. And it's a real investment. And they're also a really um, delicious, easily accessible food stuff for a whole range of wildlife, birds, mammals, reptiles, and other insects. And so a really important food chain. And so uh, next slide. Um, we, uh, what we did is we went, we took some eucalyptus samples uh, saplings and we planted them uh, under these little pretend street lights uh, to see what effect the light was having um, on this food chain on both the trees and the bugs that grow on them. And what we found was that the trees curiously were acting as though they were growing in the shade. So when trees aren't getting enough light, they, they do everything they can to um, increase their access to light. And this means things like putting more investment into leaves, foliage, less investment into roots and growing leaves that are broader and flatter and thinner, um, but therefore also uh, more prone to damage from the sun and wind. Um, and we found that trees that were growing under street lights were acting as though they were um, growing in the shade, even though they were getting full sunlight during the day. And so obviously they were growing in a suboptimal way for their environment because we were lighting them up at night and confusing, confusing them as to the amount of light that was available. And the other thing we found was that um, these lerp psyllids that were exposed to artificial light at night were producing more lerps. So a lerp, a, a lerp psyllid only produces another lerp when it moves house. When something makes it unhappy, a lack of food or a dis disruption of some kind, it builds another lerp. And we found that more of this was going on under street lights than in, in um, dark trees. And so this suggests that the lerps are also in some way being disrupted by the street lights. And this is likely to have impacts on those food chains that we talked about that rely on, on trees. So, and we're finding similar things in, in disruption of, of birds and frogs and possums and everything else. Um, so, uh, what can we do about it? Um, sorry, next slide, thanks, Teresa. Um, well, increasingly we're turning to talking about, well, what can we do to make wildlife, sorry, make lighting more sensitive to the needs of wildlife? Um, and we talk about wildlife sensitive lighting rather than wildlife friendly lighting because the only really uh, the only lighting that's good for wildlife is natural lighting, that is light from the sun, the moon and the stars on those regular natural rhythms. But we can still do a lot to make human lighting, artificial lighting, more sensitive to the needs of wildlife uh, whilst meeting human needs. And that's, that's what we're really aiming to do is, is um, um, maximise human utility and minimise ecological harm. And the lighting community has come to um, adopt a, a set of best practice lighting principles around wildlife uh, sensitive lighting. You may have seen these before. Uh, next slide, Teresa. Um, and there are six of these, and they, they basically boil down to only putting light where you need it and keeping out of areas where it's not needed. So only, to, only install lighting at all if you need it. So start with darkness. Only apply the lighting when you need it. So use timing and adaptive controls to make sure it's turned off when it's not needed. Only put light where it's needed. So use shielding and baffles and so forth to keep the light out of um, sensitive spaces. Only use as much light as you need. Don't make light more intense than it needs to be. Uh, as we've already discussed for most, but not all wildlife, warmer light um, is better than those cooler blue white lights. And finally, um, try to avoid lighting reflective surfaces because that just puts the light straight back up into the trees and out into the night sky. Um, there are, of course, some challenges with wildlife sensitive lighting. And the first of these um, is that, as I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, uh, responsibility for lighting within organizations tends to be very diffuse. And at the bottom of this um, slide here, there's just a list of some of the areas within local government um, that we've spoken to people, where we've spoken to people about lighting. So all of people in all of these areas have some responsibility for lighting in their local government area. Um, so it's very much not just a, you know, not just the public lighting team. There's a whole range of people who are involved in making lighting decisions. And of course, a lot of those people are also hearing uh, and getting inputs from consultants, developers, potential suppliers, and so on and so forth. And so what this has really underscored to us is the need um, 
but really clear guidance across organisations uh, and in their dealings with third parties to make sure that um, this wildlife sensitive lighting message is, is getting across. The next challenge um, that arises quite often is Australian standards. Um, as most of you be aware, lighting uh, in most cases, um, if not legally, at least commercially, is required to comply with Australian standards. And of course, those standards have been developed almost entirely with a focus on human vision and safe movement. And, um, and with you know, very little, if any, attention to the ecological effects of artificial light. So here, for example, we have a picture of the Baltic Bridge in Melbourne. And I'm sure every light on that bridge uh, complies with Australian standards. And yet we can see the amount of light that that is needlessly pumping out into the night sky um, and the likely impact that would have on, on bats and birds, um, but also the amount of light that it's pushing down into the water. Uh, and even better, all of that light is blue. Um, so it's that really super damaging light. Um, and yet at the moment, Australian standards would have very little uh, to say regarding that. Um, in addition, a lot of Australian standards are, are centered around uh, minimum rather than maximum. So there's very few maximum limits on lighting except where it's obtrusive or causes glare. Um, another challenge, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but there are opportunities as well. Um, um, so the first of, first of the opportunities, the good news, so to speak, is that there is now increased recognition uh, and improved guidance um, on artificial light at night. Um, so for example, it's now being starting to be recognized as a pollutant, as a problem in things like the state of environment reports at both state and federal levels. Uh, and the federal government for a couple of years ago put out the National Light Pollution Guidelines for Wildlife, um, which at the moment are voluntary guidelines, but they're, oh, sorry, next slide, thanks, Teresa. Um, um, which are uh, voluntary guidelines, but they're a really great resource um, if you want to get into this issue more deeply. And there's also, also organizations like the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance, which are out there putting out great information on how to make lighting more wildlife friendly. Um, next slide. The next opportunity is that um, the Australian standards themselves actually contain significant scope for improved lighting. So just because something um, complies with standards doesn't mean it has to be bad for wildlife. And in fact, um, by just going that step further, you can often make sure that your lighting is both standards compliant uh, and ideal for wildlife. And here's just a few examples of standards compliant lighting um, that's been done very much with wildlife in mind at Phillip Island and University of Tasmania. There are also specific carve outs in the standards for, for wildlife sensitive areas. Um, and we hope uh, future amendments to the standards will um, allow us to take wildlife expressly into account uh, when complying with standards. Uh, and then the final opportunity I just wanted to touch on uh, next slide was that um, there are now um, increasingly available wildlife sensitive lighting products. So even standard like street lighting products, which used to be available in 4,000 Kelvin, for example, are now routinely available in lower color temperatures. Um, there's huge ranges of um, shields and baffles and grills and things that you can fit to, to lights to ensure that the light only goes where you need it. Uh, and of course, smart lighting um, is making it um, much, much easier to make sure that the lighting is only on when it's needed for humans, and then it gets turned off um, to allow wildlife to, to live as naturally as possible. Um, okay, I'll, I'll hand back to you guys. There's just one more slide there. Um, if anyone wants to take a screenshot for those who are new to this uh, with some useful links um, to the National Light Pollution Guidelines uh, and also to the Australian Dark Sky Alliance approved um, lighting products and also our contact details, please reach out if we can help in any way. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marty and Teresa, as always. And if you, as I sort of mentioned before, have never um, or get a chance to see any of these guys speaking once we're allowed out into the world of um, conferences again, um, I know Teresa has spoken at some of the recent lighting summits, the smart lighting summits, um, really engaging and, and fascinating and critical for, I think, local government lighting practitioners to understand as well, we might try and touch on some of the questions around wildlife as well that did, did come through. Um, all right, I'm going to now have a bit of a chat about a project, a little mini case study for some work in the city of Bayside. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, to give as much time for questions as possible. Um, and again, just please keep jumping in with any questions you have in the box. And we've got Paul and Abhishek there to help out and respond. Um, this is a project that our lighting team um, were presented with. So a concept lighting design for um, about 360 odd metres worth of pathway through a park, which is unlit. You've got a skate park, children's playground, 
but they've also got a nature reserve just across the road with birds, insects and reptiles. Um, so we've got this interesting scenario where we want to have adequate safe lighting to P P3 for all those that like to get into the technical side of things. So we want to have safety for pedestrians and cyclists and then spill lighting to be controlled to environmental zone A0, which is as close to zero lux as possible at the nature reserve, which is just across the road. That is not the actual path, by the way. That is just a photo that I have borrowed from the internet. Um, here it is. Um, that might be a little bit hard for people to understand. And so I'm going to zoom in a little bit, um, remembering, of course, these slides will be available afterwards. Um, but this is, you can see there's the, the road that runs through and you can see on the bottom of the road, we've got a park pathway and we're gonna light that up so it's safe. On the other side, there's a nature reserve. And so we need to be you know, looking at how we're going to treat it. Um, if there's gonna be you know, existing lights to spill from the road, we don't wanna to add to that. Um, there are options for controlling and dimming. Council wanna look at safety, because there's been issues with crime. They've heard from lots of different stakeholders, whether it might be the police or dark star sky or wildlife or users of the track. And it's a matter of how all of this is um, incorporated into the advice. Um, we've also got the opportunity to look <coughs> at um, dimming as well and how light spill can be controlled. Um, this is interesting. This is from a, an example in Parramatta where we had a very angry resident in council. Um, and so the light was dimmed, all done remotely, I believe, the team here. Uh, we love this one because we just heard some really good feedback from the council and the resident afterwards who was suddenly really happy. Um, the dimming was done using design and then programming, so a CMS, which meant that the resident went from angry to happy and started giving love on council's Facebook feed instead of, oh, my God, we don't like you. Um, and so seeing the little advantages that we have and the solutions there are always interesting. Um, one of the challenges for metered lighting and when it's council owned and operated is suddenly there is this broader technology choice. And so for this particular project, the park, Parkway, um, we essentially developed a, a document that had six lighting options and recommendations and then looked at the different six um, luminaires, I guess, from a product selection point of view, making sure that it's compliant with standards. So mechanical compliance, electrical compliance and lighting performance compliance. So wattage, smarts, interoperability, um, but also costs, warranties, the optics, pole spacings, the works, the aesthetics, the colours. There's a lot that comes into it. And so the process here is then narrowing it down, thinking back to that park pathway, what's going to tick all those boxes, and two options were provided to council um, in this one. So a decorative bell-shaped luminaire, top entry, or a standard pathway luminaire. Two options. Option one, sideways and not as much backlight. So what we've got here is a light, the first one that is better when it comes to the light spill for the path. We've got a lot more where we want it a lot less where we don't. And option two, um, probably not as good because the lighting is more in the front and back. Um, we council were provided then with the option of these two um, lights. This is part of the lighting concept design process. Uh, what's interesting and one thing to keep in mind is that when you're looking at the, um, I guess the, the, the maintained the calculations that you undertake through these processes. And so when it comes to the, the safety of the light where you want it, it involves looking at it at the end of the service of the light. So what's going to happen in 20 years time once there's been depreciation in the lighting output. But when it comes to the obtrusive, sorry, obtrusive or spill lighting calculations where we want to have zero where the wildlife reserve is, that's done initially immediately. And so all of this is undertaken and you find you've got these two different lights uh, option one is a bit of a Rolls Royce. Option two is a bit cheap and cheerful. Both of them perform as required. Both of, both of them tick the boxes of compliance. And so council then have to make up their mind, consider all of those factors and consider all the sort of things that Teresa and um, Marty were talking about. If we look at option one here, the Rolls Royce, just keeping an eye on the fact where it says very dark Elston with Nature Park Reserve and very low light. This is the modelling that we undertake in the 3D rendering. 
you can see that there's very little there. And the second option, which was a little bit less expensive, um, had just a, a little bit more. And so these are the kind of things that a council has to weigh up when undertaking these processes and these projects. And this is exactly what happened here. We might actually develop a little case study in this and put it up as well, because there's some really interesting things that come up, especially when it's, um, and Marty sympathise with you when you talk about the different stakeholders that have been involved. I think maybe we all do have the same vision of utopia somewhere down the end. And so what happens for the council side of things, you know, you've got the different stakeholders from transport, traffic, police, safety, all the internal assets management, um, people that just don't want to look at a light that's not going to look the way it used to. And so it's keeping all that into consideration and weighing it all up, looking at the quality of the light output. So in this situation that we've just talked about, the Rolls-Royce light had a better luminaire quality and better distribution that was going to tick most of the boxes. The cost, option one was also five times more expensive than option two. <laughs> the sort of things that you don't need to consider as much when you're looking at those really straightforward bulk change rollovers that we've all done um, so far it becomes a little bit more challenging. There's not one or two lights, there's hundreds. They also have different um, energy consumption. It's metered as well. So you are paying for exactly what you use. And finally, aesthetics, as I mentioned, sometimes it comes down to, especially with interesting decorative lights, what people want or don't want. And it's really interesting as we see decorative light changeovers happening throughout Australia often a lot more expensive than your standard bulk change rollouts and as councils are grappling with what to do, whether to pay the extra to put in a decorative LED, for example, or a standard LED, which is a lot more affordable, but potentially going to get a lot more complaints. Um, Apologise for the title here. It's so lame, but anyway, getting smarter and dimmer. <laughs> uh, of course, what we can do with the smart lights is turn them off um, or turn them down. Um, ideally turn them off, but in the meantime, now there's a bit of a slant on that curve at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, what's actually happening is instantaneous. And so this is going from um, PP3 to PP4. Um, and so instantly at that time, the lights are dimmed, which is a much better outcome from an environmental point of view. Um, so council wanted to limit the light spill even more. Um, and if that's the case, it can be only be done through smarts. And so I think we're generally recommending when it comes to the um, metered lighting where you have complete control that you want to be incorporating smart lighting anytime. I'm looking for Paul there to correct me as well and say, yep, that's definitely the case or not. Um, jump in in the questions if you like, Paul, towards the end. Look, this is where, you know, down the track as well, council could just turn the lights off at a certain time. And having smarts just opens your world up to all of the direct lighting smart benefits, whether it is Adaptive, only come on when someone rides past, please. Road safety, asset management, so you know when something's wrong and all the long non-lighting benefits. I'm just gonna finish up with a bit of advice or some high level takeouts from this and all the projects we've worked on. Um, uh, an audit is pretty important, technology type, poll and condition to determine what you've got. And as we saw in the survey, a lot of councils have already done this developing a business case with recommendations, incorporating smart lighting opportunities where fun stuff starts um, and also where you get the improvements or the, the better outcomes around things like dimming cost and also environmental outcomes. Um, design and procurement, which is controlled by you, not the distribution business. Um, and then installation, project management and ongoing monitoring again controlled by you, not the distribution business. And so these opportunities really open up with metered lighting. I can see some questions there in the chat, but I'm gonna come back to them and pass on to our next guest first, um, Min Chao Chi from the city of Greater Dandenong, and then we'll come back from some for some Q &A. So Min Chao is the strategic infrastructure planning engineer at the city of Greater Dandenong. Uh, over to you, Min Chao. Uh. Hello everyone, my name is Ming Chao. I'm from the city of Greater Dandenong. I'm so glad to be here today. And my topic today is the standardization of the public lighting luminaries and the fittings. It is not a educational presentation or information providing session for me, 
from me. I just want to share some thoughts and then uh, uh, happy to discuss with you. Now, um, let's have a view of the pipelining in Australia. There are approximately 2.3 million street lighting lamps in service in Australia. The annual energy cost of pub lighting in Australia exceeds $125 million. And street lighting is the single largest source of carbon emissions from local government, typically accounting for 30 to 60% of the total emissions. This number is around 50% in the city of Greater Dunlop. So no accurate data on public lighting waste. However, a estimate 90% of the uh, lamps that contain mercury end up in landfill each year. They are the largest single category of consumer products uh, containing um, mercury and their disposal contribute to Australia's total annual mercury emissions. The city of Greater Dandenong has over 15,000 pub lighting within its road network, car park, and open space. Council's two targets in climate uh, emergency strategy and action plan 2020 to 30 related to pub lighting a uh, net zero um, carbon emission from council street light by 2025 and all council street and um, park lights to use energy efficient lighting technology by 2027. Here is a uh, stream shot of the United Energy owned emitter lights in CGD. We can see that we have so many different types of lighting for different lighting categories and various locations. And here, is the uh, meter lights inventory of uh, CGD under each different type of lighting. We have different luminaries and fittings. The maintenance costs increase each year significantly. A standard Australia has not established any specific manufacturing standard for LED lights. Modules and then units supply with all types of LED lights we use indoor and outdoor should be tested to meet LED modules for general lighting safety specification. The lighting, um, light fittings must go through different testing processes, thermal reports, electrical safety and the EMC compliance are three of the most important certificates a light fitting must carry, which means no matter where, where those light fittings from, if the, as long as they pass the test, they can sold in Australia. So now, well, I want to share with you the lights component that I think I sh uh, I think should be standardized. The first one is the luminary and the luminary materials for the body and the visor, and the second one is a smart P cell. Um, please know that the, the P cell is attached to the NEMA or DACA socket. The, those two sockets are already standardized for power lighting allowing future connection to the central measurement system. The third one is the uh, wireless uh, communication protocols from the smart PE cell to the gateway. The next one is the adapter and also the all bridge arms. And the next one is pole um, types. And then the last one is pole foundation. But where, what we can see on a market, this example of approved standard luminary based on the uh, OSNET specification nodes, and also the uh, United Energy specifications, which I believe most of you are familiar with already. So there are hundreds of uh, different non-standard luminary poles and fittings on the market. So hopefully we can see less and less modules and then less less cost for the maintenance replacement. And we can save the money for replacing the non-energy efficient lights with the energy efficient lights, which I believe is the most sustainable way. It seems that there's a long way to go, but the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Ming Chao. That is awesome. And thank you for also keeping to time. What a great um, presentation and guests.
Um, oh, I'm going to get rid of your sharing there and jump to some questions. There's some questions going on in the chat, which is great. Um, I'm going to just jump in though. Um, Paul, uh, Minamata, why is that important? What's, what's that all about? Minamata is a Minamata is actually a town. I think it's in India. Anyway, somewhere on the subcontinent. Yeah. Someone said yes to that. Uh, where there was significant um, mercury poisoning in the 60s or 70s. And so there was an international convention um, that was set up to limit mercury um, in all the things we buy and sell. The Australian government uh, ratified that in, uh, I think it was around 2019, 2020. In any case, um, all uh, mercury vapor lights, for example, on street lights and a whole lot of fluorescence and a whole bunch of other mercury products uh, can no longer be imported uh, into Australia. I think it was from April or thereabouts this year. Uh, and that means, for example, in major in road lighting, all of the Australian distribution businesses are either in the process of uh, replacing or have already replaced the vast majority of their street lights uh, from mercury um, lights. It's particularly important for residential areas, has implications for buildings as well, and lots of other places where there are uh, lots of mercury products. So it's driving significant investment in lighting. And obviously when investing, we can choose to uh, do additional things like smart lighting, design the lights appropriately, make sure they're not spilling light everywhere, consider color temperature and all the other things you've heard today. There you go, Japan. Thanks, Ruth. Um, tell me, there was a question, and this came through in some of the um, the questions in advance. And so, Paul, Marty, and Teresa, and Abhishek as well, jump in here, please. We've got eight or nine minutes, so we'll try and keep the answers um, short and sharp. The um, best practice principles that Marty was talking about, um, Paul, I guess, firstly, from your experience, have these been incorporated into projects? And so there are some really interesting projects in Queensland. Sorry, Marty, it is the turtles. Um, <laughs> uh, are they being incorporated in council metered lighting projects? Uh, sometimes they're being incorporated. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of, it's interesting, we did a number of projects uh, probably 10 years ago where councils used to be the power authority and so they used to stick lights up on every second pole and also have lights going everywhere because it was free electricity and they didn't have to pay for the electricity. Um, and depending on what state you're in now, that's obviously not the case. And so there was a whole lot of processes where councils used to pull all of the lights down because they weren't doing anything and they weren't required. So there's a lot of legacy issues around where lighting is. Obviously, when putting in new designs and new installations, it's very easy to design appropriately as per um, the, the options that Marty suggested. But I think there's probably a lot more work in the removal rather than the designing appropriately. Um, some An example of that is a project in Mackay uh, in Queensland, where we recently did an audit of all of their street lights, but all their metered lights as well. And they have significant areas of turtle nesting all the way up and down the coast, including very close to the to Mackay town itself. Uh, and what that audit showed was that there was a lot of lights that weren't required. Some that were required were also spilling light everywhere, including um, onto beaches and, um, and estuaries. And so there is a lot of remedial work to replace those assets or remove them and then put in place a more appropriate lighting scheme. It's not just metered lights. There was a lot of issues with road lights as well. And so when looking at existing assets, I guess understanding what you've got and then looking at priority locations and areas is the way to go. So they really just targeted what are the most important locations for that habitat consideration. And then they're going to be working through a wish list over the next five to 10 years to fix it. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Marty and Teresa, what are your experiences with that Teresa overview? 
Yeah, look, look I, I think it's always a challenge because risk is always a factor that is thrown out, right? You have, we have to have this. We need, there's, you know, perception of risk, perception of safety. But I think, you know, when you're talking about the metered lighting, if you're talking about parks and ecologically sensitive um, areas, then I think you've got to start with the, the, the wish list that Marty put in terms of start with darkness and move from there. Do you really need, even the example you just gave, although I just Googled um, Elstonwick on a pollution map and it's, it's screwed. So the other thing to think about is that actually it's not just the lights that are going down, even if they don't spill, if anything migrates or flies, it sees the lights anyway. So whatever we put in that environment, it doesn't matter how careful we are about keeping it to its two meters or five meters, from above, we have the light pollution map, okay? And, and we know that that has, I didn't talk about it, but we know that that's, that's causing animals to go off their migratory pathways. And we have some sensitive, the Marty produce the, um, the penguins down at Phillip Island. There, they actually turn off lights on the bridge during one of the important fledgling periods. So there are things that we can do. Um, that's, for the, that's for the shear waters. The shear waters, Yeah, yeah. the penguins yeah. don't fly. The penguins don't fly, sorry, no, I should mention that. Penguins aren't mammals either, which yeah, is no, a misconception, they fish. are birds or fish. Um, so I think, I just think, I, I don't actually think ecology gets considered very much at all, and I get why. Um, and so I think you've got to go back to basics. So taking out lights, Paul, as you were just talking about, and I think there is a big issue there, start at zero again, and then move forward, rather than, you know, the standards are there. We'll start with the standards and we'll work backwards. My preference would be we flip it. That's my utopia on its head. Awesome. Yeah. I'll just add very quickly to that. I think yep. some good stuff does happen, but it tends to happen for other reasons. So, for example, uh, dimming, um, which is often done for a cost saving, energy saving kind of thing, which in and of itself is, is an environmental outcome, I guess, um, can also really assist wildlife by reducing those light levels, at least for part of the night. Um, same with uh, things like curfews that are done on sports lighting. For the benefits of residents um, can also you know benefit surrounding wildlife um, and hopefully as smart lighting really takes off we'll see more and more of that stuff happening um, even if it's not primarily motivated by ecological outcomes it, it can still have benefits awesome thanks marty and then when so just when we everyone fills in the, the survey after this in about four or five minutes time if there are certain things here that we want to hear more of um, <clears throat> that are really interesting and you note it there, then we can put more of these on um, and focus on the, the wildlife and environmental benefits. Um, if there are other things, just make sure that's really clear in any responses you give. I'm going to go through a few questions that are a little bit moving away from that. The first one is around um, when are EMO going to take these on board and look into the different options for savings. And that's actually about capturing the savings that you get from dimming, I think. Um, it's not relevant to metered lighting, which, and sorry, Marty, for moving to the benefits straight into dimming from financial point of view. Um, because you'll actually get capture that immediately. We have no update on the broader process when it comes to unmetered lighting, um, but we can try and look into it. I got a question here. I'm going to just do some really quick responses, if it's all right, from people around issues um, with preventing vandalism of lighting infrastructure. Um, Paul, do you have any things you could point to there or people could look into? Uh, in terms of vandalism, then. Uh, well, I'll give you another quick example. So Horizon Power, which covers all of Western Australia, except for Perth out to Kalgoorlie and a bit of the, the southwest, invested in LEDs earlier than any other distributor in Australia. And the reason they did that was because of vandalism. They found that by replacing the old technology with LEDs, um, they were to with they were much stronger at withstanding what they called the shotgun test. Um, I can't imagine why they called it that. But uh, from a vandalism perspective, a lot of the newer lights are much better than the older lights, which doesn't mean you don't need to design them properly or not put them there if they're not required. Thanks, Paul. Um, what options are there for luminaires that don't have seven pin NEMA receptacles or Zaga sockets? Is it too late? Is there anything you can do if they don't have those from the smart's point of view? Abhishek? Um, I guess with the NEMA sockets and the, uh, the Zaga sockets, there's uh, uh, different options you can have. <laughs> there's, there's, different, there's different options you can have. Um, uh, and it's really up to the council, the, the procurement people to decide what they want. 
Mm. Um, so yeah, there's no short and simple answer to the NC NEMA or the Zaga socket at this stage. And it's and and obviously with the existing lighting technology, you can't uh, put those sockets on the lamp technologies. You need smart lights. You need uh, those smart lights with the smart uh, sockets to put them on. Yeah. All right, we're going to wrap up because three o'clock. Um, a lot of questions there. I'm going to share my screen before everyone goes just really quickly. Um, make sure you get this awesome doco that the team here have developed that touch on some of these things and hopefully answer some of the questions. Considering we just had so many questions and more than we expected, we might actually look at even just sending something around with some snappy answers. It might not be the most beautifully produced document of all time, but just to respond to them. Um, the way to respond, if you're able to jump in and put that link in there, you can click on it right now. Um, and if you give us your feedback, you'll get the slide deck and that report. Um, but I want to thank everybody for coming along. It's one of the bigger lighting uh, webinars that we've had. And I feel like this is just touching the surface. And so you could probably have a lot more of a discussion on each of the three or four topics that we've worked on in lieu of having a proper smart lighting summit as we have in previous years. Um, it feels like we've we've missed out a lot the last year or two. So looking forward to those. And as I mentioned, if you think there are certain things that you want to hear more of, I mean, obviously, Teresa and Marty, and I know Teresa, especially over the last few years, her work and all the stuff she does is out there a lot. Um, I'm sure, well, if we wanted to, if we were putting something else on, I'm, I'm hoping looking at you, Teresa and Marty, you'd be happy to come and talk about this in a little bit more depth. Um, likewise, with any other subjects or topic areas here, that you'd like to get into a little bit more depth. Otherwise, thank can I, you. Can I just make a quick plug? If anyone does please. want to talk about measuring lighting or the ecological impacts within your councils, then please do um, get in touch with Martin or I via Ironbark or, or direct link. That would be great. We're very awesome. keen to actually measure now. Awesome. Even better. Um, so thank you, Teresa and Marty. They're really interesting um, presentations. Ming Chao, thank you as well for your presentation. And it could be one that we can get into as well in more detail around the standardization. Um, to Paul and Abhishek and Charlotte, much appreciated. Um, jump onto that, give us your feedback, and we will also get this video out the next few days. But appreciate everyone rocking up, and we'll catch you next time. See ya. See ya. Thanks, Alexi. Thanks so much. Thanks, crew. Let me just. All righty. We'll stop that. Thanks, guys. We've got control here.